Roger again. Good to see you. Thanks for joining us. You're welcome. I think we are 20 past, so I think we're crack on straight away. So what we're going to start with, um, I'd like to just say uh, a good evening to everybody and thank you so much for giving up some of your precious free time to join our event, which I hope you find very informative and will give you a better understanding of FASD in the UK in 2021. My name is Andrew Keeping and I'm the uh, CEO of FASD Awareness and a foster carer and a musician, as you see. Um, before handing over to Dr. Raja, I'd like to introduce you to our charity, FASD Awareness. FASD Awareness was founded by Tracy Allen, who, having fostered children with FASD for over 14 years, strived for a greater understanding of the condition and the need to build a network of professionals with the necessary knowledge. Her tenacity to help others living with FASD led her to launch the FASD Awareness campaign campaign in 2015, setting out to raise a greater awareness of the condition and supporting those living with it. FASD Awareness is a charity which in the last four years has grown from a small local initiative into a national charity offering crucial and life-changing guidance and support to individuals living with FASD and their families and carers. Children with FASD are socially limited Isolation is common and their families struggle fun finding appropriate childcare, activities, clubs and opportunities that the children can manage. The existing provisions for children with FSD is currently very limited as it is still a much misunderstood and misdiagnosed condition. Those living with it and their parent carers and families struggle to get the support they need and there is a lack of understanding within the care system, often leading to huge delays in receiving treatment, which further adds to the frustrations, misery and confusion faced by those living with FSD. They need a safe environment, which offers opportunities for them to develop friendships, essential skills and gr gain greater independence. The family's carers need signposting and guidance to enable them to support the individuals with all aspects of their lives as they struggle with finding appropriate schools, receiving relevant benefits, obtaining the correct diagnosis, and managing even the most basic of activities such as days outs, holidays, childcare, etc. FASD awareness are able to signpost families and carers to the relevant and necessary services and their network and considerable experience offers immediate reassurance, helping them to reduce their frustration and feel less isolated. Now, as the pandemic started to disrupt nearly every facet of society, it was rightly at the forefront of public health and professionals' attention. In response to this, emergency and the ongoing social distancing regulations, the charity started running online support meetings to continue to fulfill our mission of raising awareness of FASD and supporting those who are living with FASD and their parents and carers. The virtual support groups have been hugely successful and a valuable experience for all involved. And we've all learned so much from this as well. You can see tonight, this is the first time we've used a webinar um, technology and it won't be the last, but uh, at least I would have learned from this. So thank you for your patience there. We've welcomed individuals from all corners of the UK and parts of America at all. As we all know, when the UK went into lockdown early last year, many people reacted to the closures of pubs and restaurants by stocking up to drink at home in isolation. And alcohol sales rose by 67% during the first week of the pandemic. One example of predictable collateral damage from the current pandemic will be a significant rise in the cases of babies born with FASD across the UK. So there is much work still to be done to spread awareness of the dangers of alcohol use during pregnancy. We were incredibly excited recently to launch our last uh, film on Thursday last, which was FASD Day. And it's the film that we produced was called What Alcohol Can Do to a Fetus as part of our Be Aware campaign. This film explores specifically what can happen to an unborn baby when it is exposed to alcohol. The script was developed with Dr. Raja Mukherjee, who you will hear from in a very short while, and Dr. Soji Abiona, consultant community paediatrician and trustee of FASD Awareness. The film also contains a final message from Jess Reed, Deputy Chief Midwifery Officer, NHS England. We produce many other films as well as 
for our Be Aware campaign. But I think it's about time now I introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Raja Mukherjee, consultant psychiatrist, adult learning disability consultant psychiatrist for Surrey and Borders Partnership, NHS Foundation Trust, and internationally acclaimed expert in FASD. We like to call him the godfather of FASD in the UK. So Raja, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, thank you. And particularly on your annual leave. I wouldn't leave. call myself a godfather of, of that. I certainly wouldn't. Um, but I hope we haven't got you into too much trouble because it's your annual leave. So we really appreciate you taking yeah, it's this. All right. You've got me up doing DIY around the house. It's fine. Well, I'm glad we could help you with that. It's um, right. We're going to follow the format. Raja and I discussed this earlier. We're going to follow the format of an audience with Raja, if you like. Um, and we've got some pre-submitted questions that I will put to Raja during the course of the hour. Our team will also be asking you to submit questions and answers in the facility on the side so that if we don't cover it today we will then um, try and follow up with some answers and help you out but I, I've tried to make it as concise as I can and cover as many areas as we can so let's kick off with the first question if I may Raja and that's really how did you get involved in FASD at the beginning? Um, okay, so by accident is a simple answer to that is um, I had started as a lecturer at St George's, which is um, in South London. My then boss, now Baroness Sheila Hollins, um, gave me a pack of information. We've got a website that, that so it's still there, intellectual.disability.info, which is to teach students about um, intellectual disabilities. And there was a pack of information sent from a lady called Margaret Murch, who was running a charity a bit like yours in Liverpool. But it was like Tracy when she started a little local charity. But she sent through information to um, the, the website and saying, can you stick this information on there, trying to raise awareness, very similar to what Tracy was doing. Um, as the new lecturer in the department, it was my job. She sort of said, there you go, you can make this um, more scientifically referenced, put it onto the site, because at the moment it was literally about 40 pages of cut and paste, and we couldn't do that. So it had to be tailored. And it just started an interest, and it never went away. Um, and that's pretty much it. I just never had stopped after that point. So it was by accident, really. Well, thank God for that. Um, we've got so many people from in the professional sector, as well as people that are living with FASD. So it's a nice cross spectrum today, which is fantastic. Can you give us a bit of an idea of how far we've come in that time? Because certainly over the last couple of years, there's been a dramatic shift in people's um, the momentum. Yeah, it's grown a lot in the last five, five ten years. Um, the first ten years of this was really slow and tiresome and labour. You know, it was the problem was there was a lot of questions and not many answers. And I think that is the problem. And there was a lot of when there aren't many answers, people can basically say, "Oh, well, you don't know what you're talking about," or, or you know, um, "This isn't a real thing, is it?" Because the answers weren't there. So one of the things that we had to do was to slowly develop some of those. So I think what's made me different to the people who were interested before, because there were other people around um, who had interest, but there were local clinicians who did it in a local area rather than taking it forward in a more national kind of way. And also the difference between me is I, because I've got an academic head on me and I wanted to do research, is that we were able to publish and produce a lot of information and answer some of those fundamental questions so if we look now is we've moved the field on from you know there's there's what nearly 100 people on this call at the moment if you'd yeah, it should be yeah so, so so there's if you could get something like 20 people in a room back then i'm talking 2003 you're doing well you know, one of the biggest conferences that were put, was put on to start with in 2004 by Gloria Armistead, who had about 50 people in the room. And we were really excited to have so many people. You know, the big places that existed were over in the States and Canada. The UK was very far behind. You had people like Gloria, you had people like Susan Fleischer, very much pushing things on. You know, and I was... I was still in a learning stage. I shouldn't have been the expert back then. I think I know what I'm talking about now, 
but this is 20 years down the line. I've been doing it for a long time. I know my bits of it quite well. But back then I was still learning and still questioning things and starting to try and pull that apart. So we've moved a huge amount in terms of a lot of the questions about we now understand how common it is roughly. We've got an idea of how complicated complex the presentation is. We've got more evidence that the face isn't what it's all about. We've got evidence to show that people aren't getting support and that it's not us just making it up. We've got actual research evidence to prove that. We've got evidence to show that there are interventions that can make a difference. We've got evidence-based guidelines now coming out, which can demonstrate there are benefits to making a diagnosis early. One of the problems that we had earlier on was 20 years ago, everything was still about the face. The literature that existed was more about the narrow group who had the most severe effects. So if you look at Hans Spohr's work, I love Hans, don't get me wrong. Hans is an amazing person. He was one of the few first people there. He's such a lovely guy. Um, but his cohort, if you read his literature, is from a group who were very severely affected. They all, most of them had intellectual disability. The minority of them went on to work. And that is what people thought was a long-term consequence for this. If you look at the broader spectrum of people who are affected by alcohol without the face, that's not the trajectory you see in everybody because there's a lot of range of possibilities depending on the level of interventions you can get. Now, whilst there are some core deficits, as you mentioned in the introduction, you know, we know, understand so much more now than we did back then. 20 years ago, the scanning technology that the states and other people now are using and the availability of genetic testing to rule other things out and the, the epigenetic mechanisms and understanding pathogenesis, all of that is 20 years further on. You know, we have other people coming in at a time where people can start to make a difference. And, you know, places like NICE are now interested. We have the sign guidance with the Scottish government investing. None of that existed back then. So if I look at it as a cup half full uh, and a journey where we want to get to where we all want to get to, you know, I can see that we're halfway down the road. If you come into it, at the start of it that this journey it still feels like there's a long way to go but you've not seen how far we've come you know and it was again Sheila who put this to me very early in my training is that she said using intellectual disability as an example of how far she had come in her lifetime working with it and how far she still had to go you know she's a baroness in the house of lords making the difference on an ongoing basis but you remember the things that people like that have said to you and I look at it in the same kind of way and say, look, well, actually, do you know what? We've actually come a long way. It's been 20 years getting that long way, but actually in the next 20 years, it seems to be an exponential growth at the moment. So who knows where we'll be? In Kent, for example, it is now embedded into pathways, as you know, where FASD will be something that people can get access to. It will be available. We're supporting that process again, as you know. And so that would never have happened 20 years ago. It's a commission service by the people listening to people like yourselves and Tracy and working with us to try and guide a way forward so people have access to service. Now that wouldn't have happened. Um, and that's progress. And if we can get that around the country, that will make a huge difference. Absolutely. I'm interested um, when you're talking about epigenetics, because quite often a lot of our families and um, the questions that are, have been sent through are about the multidisciplinary approach to diagnosis. Mm -hmm. Expense of that, because it, it, it really doesn't allow a lot of people to actually get that diagnosis because it can be very expensive. The misdiagnosis. Can you explain a little bit about the present model of diagnosis, but also where you mentioned in 20 years time, it will be very different, it likely to be very different. Can you explain and go into a bit more detail on that? So, okay, so when I started, it was me doing it on my own. Now, what I went away and reflected on is why was that happening? And it was because I'm a doctor and what doctors do is they pull together information. If you go into a hospital, and you've got a cough, you go and see the, the clinician, they will say, right, I'm gonna take a history, I'm gonna auscultate your chest. I think, right, there could be A, B, C, or D. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna send you for a blood test, I'm gonna send you for an X-ray, I'm gonna send you for this, this or the other scan, and then you're gonna come back and see me, I'll look at all the results, and then we'll decide what's going on. That's the medical model, okay? 
Um, and that's what I was effectively doing is when you talk about multidisciplinary assessment, because of the nature of FASD, looking at these different domains, looking at communication, looking at executive function, looking at cognition, looking at sort of adaptive behavior, you know, it's not necessarily something that one person on their own can do all these different tests. We come with different backgrounds, but one person can collate the information. And that's what I was doing, is that I was doing some of the tests which I could do myself, and I was collating information from other sources to come to conclusions. Now, the skill that we're gonna to have to do is to work out what needs to happen at a local level where these different facets can be pulled together to give you the information. And when do you need more specialist assessment because it's more complex and you need to pull things apart a little bit. And so that is some of the thinking. When we talk about what's moved on, it's having done it for a while, and understood what works and what doesn't work not the, the not working bit is often the more interesting part of it because it teaches you far more than the bits that do work kind of then highlights for you as a way forward and as a model because what's not possible is if we have only clinics like myself you'll be waiting forever what you need to do is to embed it into pathways that exist as far as possible and you need to educate people so there's a higher level of basic skill so when you go and see your pediatrician locally and you're in a new developmental pathway they've got enough skill to deal with the majority of cases and it's only the really complicated ones where there's a lot of things going on that you need to step up to services like mine which does have everybody in place um, and so whilst you need to have a multidisciplinary set of information it doesn't mean it has to be done by a single person and that is the mistake that i think some people make and they misunderstand how things are interpreted so sign is very much based on the canadian guidance which talks about that multidisciplinary approach and don't get me wrong if you've got access to a multidisciplinary team that's great but the expense of that is out of keeping with what you will get in the nhs let's just be honest mm -hmm. you know there is not parity of esteem between acute and mental health and so if you're going down a behavioral route and you're going into that, there is not parity of esteem. So if you want to get services, sorry, I'm being controversial here, but I'll, I'll say it again, there isn't parity of <laughs> esteem. Um, but um, we see it all the time working in mental health, it's really frustrating. But the fact is, um, all this waiting list initiative that they're talking about, we haven't heard how much is coming to mental health, probably very little of it. Um, but the fact remains is that if we're going to address this and get people embedded and seen quickly you have to embed it into pathways that exist as far as possible if you try and create lots of new stuff they're not going to give you the money for it it just isn't going to happen and so you have to find a way of trying to embed this into approaches and so you know that's one of the benefits of having been doing this for a while is that we've done some of that thinking mm. you know we've done ways of working, this works, this doesn't work, let's think about doing this. And so when we sort of set up, for example, your the model in Kent, we were able to say, look, let's try some of these. These are the things that we've tried and those discussions could be had from a basis of this is what we've experienced and this is what we know can work if we get the right um, knowledge, the right engagement to do that. And it will hopefully progress. And there's gonna be stumbles along the way because we've not done it before. And that's the thing that I've learned along the way is that what you don't do is not do it because you're worried about failure because effectively those failures show you what you should have done differently but you should still try it and hopefully what we've got is something where you know that will progress further so it's a very long-winded way of answering your question but effectively what we were saying is we need to try and embed better knowledge but also embed pathways everywhere that people can go to their local pediatrician, get a basic quality assessment with what resources they have. And if they haven't got those resources, then step it up to places that you do. So those pathways exist. And, you know, this was written into the 2016 Board of Science document. You know, we helped contribute to that. Um, but effectively, it's not an unusual model. And it's one that exists in many other parts of medicine. Um, and so we would like to see it embedded here. So people don't have to travel from say Newcastle down to Surrey, they should be seen in Newcastle. And what do you see with this? Um, we've got this sort of hub and spoke approach that we've discussed there, but what about looking ahead to the future? You were mentioning in 20 years time, what can we look forward to hopefully? I know that it's not gonna help many of our families at the moment, but you know, this FASD baby boom and future generations, what can we look to or have some hope for? What insights have you got into that? Um, well, that's a difficult, one, actually, because um, 
if the hub and spoke works, then I think that is where you will probably balance out and you will plateau for a while until everybody knows enough about it that you don't even need the hubs, if you see what I mean, because everyone's got the, you need the, the spokes would be doing the job. But the problem is the nature of the NHS is you're all, most of the spokes will be a single practitioner with maybe a psychologist who won't be able to do all of it. So there's always going to be some complex cases that needs more specialist mm -hmm. um, input. And so that's why we've talked about hub and spoke because, you know, and this is common in medicine is that you have, so, so I'll give you an example. My son, when he was three, he's 17 now, so it was a long time ago, um, had some blood in his urine. And so he went to the local pediatrician. The local pediatrician says, I think it's nothing, nothing serious, but I'll get it checked out by the guy who comes up from King's once a quarter. And we just book him into that clinic and just get checked out. The guy from King's said, no, it's nothing serious. Um, so it'll, 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 it'll go away and, and we were done. But that's hub and spoke because it brings a level of expertise where you can pull things into it. Now, they could have been, for example, people go up to Great Ormond Street and other things, or they go to their regional centre. It exists. It's a concept in medicine that is very familiar. And so I think that's where I would see it. But the, the difference will be is that every person who's referred from their GP to, to, um, to the local paediatrician or to psychiatry isn't always having to be the one explaining what's going on and why, is that they just go there and people go, oh, this is what it is. And they think about it, they understand it and they get on with it. You know, in the same way that with autism and ADHD now that, you know, you may have long waiting lists because of the under investment, but um, you get a knowledge or an understanding of what to do and you're starting to get intervention. And the same will hopefully happen with FASD. You've brought me beautifully onto talking about ADHD and autism and quite a few of the questions that we've had is that there are specialists out there that claim to be specialists and know very little about FASD, but they do understand ADHD and ASD and they're being medicated for that. One of the, um, I'm going to go into a specific question, if I may, and that is that um, one of the uh, questions was my son is nine and started on Medicinet XL five milligrams and is now 30 milligrams he responds well under the medication but has the opposite at home school keeps pushing to increase the dose we have already tried 40 milligrams a day but did not solve the problem of him focusing for us it seems that school don't know how to handle him my borough does not want to offer a, another school and unfortunately he hates attending this one I fear I will end up having to homeschool him. What would you suggest for a different type of medication that lasts longer so school can manage? Well, the first thing is it should all, I don't want to really get into individual no. discussion because, no. because no. you take it away from the pediatrician and then I'm undermining professional relationships. So you'd have to be careful. Um, that's the first thing I need to be very clear about because it's not appropriate. So, but... Having said that, Medikinet is a, a medication that has about six hours of working life. The way that these ADHD medication work is, whether it's Medikinet, Concerta, Equisim, they're all methylphenidate. The only difference between the three drugs is how they're released. So Medikinet was designed for the German market. Um, and so it's a designer drug. And effectively what you have is that it has an immediate release of 50%, so it's a very high initial peak, and it's a second release after about two or three hours, and then slowly it wears off. It was designed for the German school market, so they would concentrate at school from about 7.38 until about 2.30, when they stopped, and it wears off. And so the description you have there of somebody who is working well at school, but then tailing off at home, it's not surprising, because it's tailing off, and the effects have gone away upping the dose will not stop that tailing off it'll just mean that they're more focused for that little bit longer at school but if they're focused already at school the question is should he be doing that but this is the sort of conversation you should be having with the person who's prescribing it because they should know this level if i see so my, i've got different hats so i'm an i'm an adult neurodevelopmental psychiatrist and so i deal with uh, adult adhd and autism as my general stuff and one day a week we do lifespan fasd ADHD, you know, if I was seeing you for ADHD, this is the conversation we'd have. We'd have a conversation say, this is the kind of profile, this is how long it will last, this will be the different type of things to work with. The thing with somebody with, with FASD is the stimulants can make you more agitated. And so it can actually make you more stimulated and more aroused so you actually do function. The person who's 
FASD also has a brain that is working harder to do the same thing, so they get tired. So by the time they get home, they're utterly knackered, and all they want to do is, you know, chill out. And so there's there's different things you could do. The lack of country, you know, at school there's a very clear set routine. When you go home, the routines are often less secure. And I obviously don't know this case, but that mm. tends to be a less structured routine at home compared to school. And so there's different factors that actually lead the individual to, to function in a different kind of way. So you know, there are lots of potential conversations to be had about looking at what that profile and lifestyle is and saying, what can we do to moderate it and manage it? Every, not everything is ADHD. Sometimes it's anxiety, sometimes it's hyperarousal. There are other factors to consider. So when you're looking at the behavior management, you know, and I, and I apologize for what's saying like that, but it's a very psychiatric way of doing it. I can't help myself, unfortunately. Um, um, but when we're thinking about that, it's trying to understand, first of all, what is going on? You know, is this still ADHD? How much of this is hyperarousal and anxiety? How much of this is overstimulation and sensory? How much of this is just their innate nature to need to have direct input. We know people with FASD are very pro-social and need lots of ongoing input and very clear direction on a regular ongoing basis. It's a neurological disorder and they have a different profile to other neurological disorders because it is a different etiology. And so you have to understand that person and in that context and drugs aren't the answer to everything. Drugs are part of the picture, part of the jigsaw, but they're not the whole jigsaw. And so before you ever start to say, this is what you do, let's up the dose or let's change the dose, you need to look at the big picture of the individual and say, what is it, the context, what is going on and how is that functioning? You know, and, and that's where it's important. And that's the kind of sophistication that a lot of people don't get into, unfortunately, and is really important for these kids because they're not simple in many ways. Once you've done the work and you understand them and you can pull them apart, say this bit is, the ADHD, this bit is the sensory, this bit is the hyperarousal, this bit is the social communication difficulties, as you alluded to right at the start, then you can start to say, this is what we do about each section of it. But saying there is a, a sledgehammer, i.e. the drug to sort everything out, doesn't work. And in some cases can make it worse. And so you do have to be really careful about what you're doing and understanding in order to get the right kind of output, which is why I think it's important. I like, don't talk about individual cases because it's often far more complex and involved than than the generic but what we would be looking at if this was a case for us would be trying to break it down to say well, what else is going on is this about that is there other stuff going on and so in the kent contract for example we will have the management side of it where people can bring these discussions and we can think about the different facets and help people work through so they come to think in that kind of way and it's not just about one thing because it's not just ADHD. This is not pure ADHD, but ADHD is one outcome because those parts of the brain are also damaged. Autism is not that it's not autism, but it's a different type of autism because there's, there's an overlap in the pathways that cause autism that are damaged as well. But there are other things that happen as well. And so you end up with a complex presentation where it's not classic one thing or another, it's FASD leading to this more complex profile and presentation so therefore we need to understand that profile in the context of the FASD and then think what do we do to manage it as a whole not just one bit which brings us on beautifully to working in education I'm doing well aren't I bringing your doing really well. yeah I, I, there's no prompting honest I what I particularly liked about that that covered so many of the questions that came in on medication so thank you for that um looking at education as well and understanding a lot of people understand ADHD or think they understand ADHD and think they understand autism. We all have a greater understanding of those two areas. And so therefore, when they focus on those, it becomes, it takes it away from the umbrella FASD term. Now, if you were, what would you say are the areas, and I know I'm generalizing here, but it will help many of those that are listening today that are working from education and professional services. How would you differentiate between ADHD and autism with what puts them aside from FASD, the umbrella term? Okay, so I think the first thing to say is ASD and ADHD are not a single thing. 
Um, there are multiple causes of ADHD. There's multiple causes of ASD. In my adult service, a third of the people we see with autism overlap with ADHD, and there's common comorbidities. Around five to 10% of the people we see with autism have FASD. You know, and so FASD is what we consider an etiological diagnosis. It's the cause of the underlying neurological and body damage. Now, the argument I always put to people is, if you saw somebody with Down syndrome, would you refuse to diagnose them because you don't think it's important? And I've never met one person who said, yeah, obviously it's, it's a waste of time diagnosing Down syndrome. Nobody ever would because it makes no difference to their life and, it's, and we just get on with everything else. Nobody's ever said that to me because people see that. Now that means it's because it's easy to spot, not because it's any less important to spot. Now people with Down syndrome, we know that they're likely to have some physical health problems, just like FASD. We know there's some psychological and neurological problems, just like FASD, but they're different. If you have a etiology, say cornea de Langer or Fragile X, you have a different profile compared to FASD, but they're still etiological profiles. All of these can lead, if the neurological damage is in the pathways that cause damage social communication or rigidity or hyperactivity or impulsivity, ADHD or ASD symptoms, because that's what's happening. Now, the difference between alcohol and some other things is the nature and degree of damage will differ from individuals. So a lot of people have difficulties without having a severe presentation. But when you add all these little difficulties together, it becomes a problem overall. Now, if, you, if that person with lots of little difficulties goes to see the autism practitioner, I say, you haven't got autism, go away. They then go and see the ADHD practitioner and they say, you haven't got ADHD, go away. But they've got some impulsivity. They've got some social communication difficulties. They've got working memory deficits as executive planning. And they've got no label to understand what all this pulls it together. And FASD is the thing that binds it because it's the thing that's caused all of it. And that's where it becomes important because you need to understand all of the complexity and how it differs. Because you know, just because you have damaged social communication pathways and you are you actually more severely affected, so you do meet autism criteria, the type of autism is different to, for example, somebody with fragile X who's got autism. They can be diametrically opposed, in fact, in terms of their profile. So you're seeing different things. And so understanding again context the whole jigsaw not just one bit of it is what's important and I think too many people focus on their little bit of the jigsaw rather than seeing the whole person which is where it's really important um, and so it's all about putting things into the right context we will always assess for ADHD and ASD because they're common outcomes because the type of damage that's happening is front to back midline <coughs> that tends to be damaged in terms of neurological functioning, which will impact on your social communication pathways, your inhibitory control pathways, you know, your, your, um, your default mode network, which is your daydreaming pathways. You know, if those are damaged, you're gonna end up with these kind of presentations. Now, mm. how damaged they are will depend on how much affected. If they're very mildly damaged, you may not have any impact at all that's noticeable and you just get on with your life. Um, and so therefore, it's only when things are challenged that it becomes obvious. But, you know, for most people like that, it's not considered an issue. You just had prenatal alcohol exposure, no problem. But it's when these start to impact adaptively onto your life that you lead to the challenges where they need to get help. Because what you need for a lot of situations is just that scaffolding and that reasonable adjustment to their lives and that little bit of support around the things that they struggle with to change their trajectory. Now, some people need lots of support lots of understanding, lots of change, but that depends on the individual. And this is where a population study compared to a clinic study is different because if you look at the population of people who are exposed to alcohol, most people get on with their lives without ever turning up into a clinic. You know, some don't, and they're the ones who are the most affected, and that's the two to four percent of people who we've recently recognized in the UK as having FASD. And so that is the ones who are most affected, who need to have the greatest help. Because if you think about it, 80% of the women in the UK, 80% of women drink, you know, whilst when they become pregnant, a th two thirds are stopping, there's still a proportion of people continue, but not all of those are having FASD kids. So it's not a direct correlation between you drink, you have a kid. 
so there's other things going on which affect that so but it's about understanding the risks that people are taking and the potential harm that could happen which is unpredictable so therefore that's where you end up with and and you know, and that's the whole nature of it is what we're dealing with is a situation where the brain is affected and these outcomes occur and th those outcomes are what we have to see and manage but what i always push people back to is look at the person these diagnostic labels are useful because they help explain and they're shorthand and they guide you but it doesn't tell you everything about the individual. You need both sides. You need the diagnosis and you need the formulation together. And we get into arguments about should you have one or the other, whereas I think it needs to be both. With that diagnosis and the assessments, there are many children that we've come into um, contact with that have a fluctuating capacity. Can you tell us how do you, because one day they might assess in one way, uh, you know, there's, the period of time that you're able to assess these individuals. Um, how do you manage that? So when you talk about capacity, capacity is defined in law. Is you have to be able to take on board the information, you have to hold it in your memory, you have to weigh it up and then be able to communicate it back. And you have to not be influenced or biased by other people. And so effectively, when we're assessing capacity, these are the kind of things that you need to assess. However, there are times where it has to be slightly contextual. So if I ask you, sort of in a cold situation here, just one-on-one, -on -one, there's no other distractions, what happens if you do this? What happens if you do that? Often you'll get the right answers because you're getting a simple question to a simple answer. When you start to embed other things going on, like there's distractions, there's other sensory stuff going on, there's multiple things happening, so you have to weigh things up. Your ability to act and consider your actions in that context are not always rational. And so capacity may well be deemed in a cold setting, but not in a hot setting, there's other factors going on. And the British um, Psychological Society published a document, I think two or three years ago now, on capacity, which talked about uh, in trionic brain injury, the executive function paradox. And it's something that we see in these kind of presentations as well, where that people who have that executive deficit, where there's problems with how their frontal lobes work, is they, especially people like FASD, where they can do sequential tasks, is A leads to B leads to C leads to D, which is a lot of kids with the FASD can do. What they can't do is parallel tasks, where you have to do several things at the same time. And so a simple decision making is you need to think about what's going on, be aware of your surroundings, think about the options which you pull out of your working memory, which we know is a deficit, manage them, weigh them up, think about, should I do this or the other? That's an executive function task, another area of deficit. Um, and so, and then communicate it and make a decision. Now, in a cold setting, say social workers with, a, with somebody, where you ask a single question, you get a single answer, you can take people through, say, yeah, well, they've seemed to have capacity but their actions say different. And so you sometimes have to balance it between that. But the challenge there is it's getting into very, um, it, it's, it's, it's not clear cut and you end up with potential court related cases, court of protection kind of issues, because what you're fundamentally saying is that we're taking away liberties from the individual. You're take, changing some of these human rights in certain situations um, and that can be difficult. Um, and the law on what is considered and deemed capacitous will change. So, for example, to get into a sexual relationship, for example, all you need to be able to do is to know that it involves intercourse, that you could get pregnant and you could have an STI. That is it. You don't need to know anymore to demonstrate capacity. And that is what the law has demonstrated. So it's a very, very low, low bar in terms of what is deemed capacitous to do that, whereas the for managing your own money the bar is far far higher you know the impact you have to have on other people those kind of factors are considered far greater than if you are for for other deemed which are deemed basic human rights and so it's not a simple argument either way thank you um i'm gonna move on a little bit to um older individuals 
Jules with FASD. And uh, one question, again, it is a specific, and I respect that you we're not going to go into the details, but we'll generalise if we may. Um, as we have a 17-year-old with FASD, we are experiencing big challenges with substance abuse. We wonder if FASD brains react differently to alcohol, as our son seems to have blackouts, unmanageable anxiety and threats of suicide, for example, when consuming alcohol. Would you like to go into a little bit about that? So the answer is yes. It, there is some evidence to suggest that they're more susceptible to the impact. Now, if you have damage to your orbital frontal cortex, which is one of the main areas where the damage occurs, that is your inhibitory control centers. And so what you, happens when you drink is you switch them off. So whether it's any of us, the reason why we start acting disinhibited and we start to do silly things and make silly decisions when we're drunk is because that switches off. Now, if you've already got damage, it doesn't take as much to switch that off. Um, and effectively, that's partly what you tend to see. There is some research to suggest that there is a propensity towards alcohol anyway, which is in, you know, the, it was a mice mouse study, which was done quite a while ago, is they found the mouse pups were more inclined to, to be attracted towards the alcohol compared to the pups who had not had alcohol um, in utero. Um, and so there may be something about the brains, but that's never been replicated in humans. And so there may be something there um, that makes you more pr predisposed to it, but we don't know what that is. And so the answer is there's numerous reasons why it may be. The, what, the problem that you've got is these kids can see what everybody else is doing. They want to be the same as everybody, yet they don't understand that they, at that stage, that they are more vulnerable. And it's unfortunately, you know, and this is from seeing adults, is they go through, often go through a period of difficulty before they realize I need to do something different to change my trajectory. And, and you, it's very hard to intervene until they want to do it. And it's the most challenging for parents who see this happening, who want to do something, but the law at 18 changes. And when they turn 18, they are responsible for what they want to do. Um, and until they choose to want to make a difference, it's really difficult, which is why it's so important, if you can, to embed that knowledge. If it's just you have something that you need to look after yourself more because you're more vulnerable to different factors. And if you need help, come to us, whatever. You know, but it's that single mindset change from I can do everything that everybody else does to I've got some issues, I've got difficulties. And if I do it differently, I can have a normal-ish life, but with this understanding but people reject it and you see it in everything with chronic conditions is that they get to teenagers and they don't want it anymore and so they push back and these kids are vulnerable and it, things happen unfortunately we just had a fascinating conversation with a 16 plus friendship group um and giving them the freedom to be able to educate us really about the complications they've had in their journey and then be able to explain to us what what has frustrated them about FASD month this month has been how uh, there's been a lot of focus on, on individuals um, and families, how to manage the behaviours better. Um, and they're seen as victims. We're talking about, uh, talking about an attitude, a way that we refer to individuals with FASD. Now, it's changing. The language is changing. And... I, the thing that we're getting from a lot of um, a lot of our our individuals is they're referring to themselves as just normal people with greater disabilities or difficulties managing things in life, and they want that to come across to the wider public and the wider audience. And we're using case studies at FSD to be able to evidence that and show people and try and educate people more. And the thing that came across more than anything else was they just want people to give them time to answer. Can you tell us a little bit more from your experience how that's been the case for many of the um, people that come into your clinic? 
Yeah, it's exactly what they want is when people come to clinic, I talk at them on purpose. I give them a spiel for about five minutes and then we go into what do you, and anybody who's coming, you're going to, you're getting the trick as to what you do now. So, so don't cheat. Um, you don't see me much these, much these days. Alex runs the internal clinic mostly anyway. Um, but um, you then find, you then you slow down and then you give them little chunks of information. They take it on board far better. And then they start engaging because you're trying to show them the difference between it. But what the thing that I sort of say is quite often they're nodding their heads, they're giving you the right cues to say that they're understanding it, but they're not. And because they want to fit in and they don't understand, they say, actually, sorry, I didn't understand that. When I worked in the St. George's, we had um, um, a we had basically people with intellectual disability as trainers in the department working with us to train the students and there was there was a, a girl there called Wendy who was one of the, the, the people with intellectual disability who was a co-trainer and she would be the one who'd always ask the questions of the professors what does that mean and we go thank goodness somebody's asked because we didn't know what it meant but nobody would be you'd feel too silly to ask that question because you should know you're the academic but Wendy was the person who asked the question these kids don't have their internal Wendy as I put it into to be able to say I don't understand I don't I can't because it's it makes you feel different and people don't want to feel different they have enough insight to know that they're not getting it but not enough insight or ability to stand up and be able to ask those questions you know and that is the right kind of thing to do so your adult group or your teenage group where they're saying we'd like to slow down that's brilliant but in real world unless you've got those labels and the adjustments that you can go to people and say we need to work like this for you when we talk about behavioral management <clears throat> often it's about the world adapting and adjusting to their needs not us putting in aba style behavior management that's not what it's about it's about often a lot of the behavior management approaches is about environmental change other people doing it different not about the individual having to because they're 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 who they are you're not going to change that so what you're trying to do is to understand what to do to to make life easier for them and if you make life easy for them you make life easy for those around them and i think that's a fundamental thing to consider and it's a mistake that people make is by thinking we have to manage these kids you don't you manage the whole situation and if you make that better then everything gets better so trying to force them to do mathematics if they rubbish at maths you know and they're not going to get it you have to either do it differently or you actually accept maybe they're just not going to be good at maths susan fleischer used to tell me that her her life with addy who was a daughter got much better when she stopped trying to force her to do maths uh, and the stress and the push and actually she became a really good horse rider and so doing things that made people's self-esteem better, engaging in those kind of factors, you know, it makes a huge difference it to does. the whole situation. I, I completely agree with that. I, you know, in my career as a musician, my greatest students, those that have been the most successful, have had some form of learning disability, actually. And they've overcome their disability or adapted to their disability to be able to excel in a particular field. And this is the positivity that we want to, you know, there's a lot of doom and gloom around FASD because of the lack of understanding. And one of the things that we do in our training, particularly to um, foster carers and foster agencies and adoption and schooling, it's about understanding the individual that wraparound service, that wraparound care that is so important. Can you can you go into that a little bit more? Just I know we're we're coming towards the end now, but that would be a really useful resource for many of us so families. The, the first thing I'm going to say is um, is what you said about music. There's a lot of people with FSD who are very artistic. You know, they're good at music. You know. Um, they're good at art stuff which you look at it and think wow I can't I could never do that mm -hmm. because they've got strengths as well as weaknesses and so it doesn't mean everybody's going to have that but there are a whole group of them where you need to build on their their positive I think for me the first thing to do is that, I'll give you an example when we assess people we're looking not just at what their deficits are it's not just a deficit model it's a skills-based model what are the strengths <laughs> as much as where the weaknesses are and what you do is you scaffold their weaknesses and you build on their strengths so what we're saying is basically 
I've got, it's like, I've got, I've got a broken left leg. You're not going to make you do the hundred meters. What you do is you give you a, a crutch for your, for your leg and then let you do all the rest of it. So you have to scaffold and support the bits they're not good at. And that's the stuff that goes around the individual, but then you let them thrive in the stuff that they can do well. That will help their self-esteem. It will give them a trajectory in life that they will enjoy, you know, and they will give them something to fulfill them. But, you know, if they happen to have difficulties in one area or another, well, we accept that and we move on. If they've got sensory issues, we find ways of managing it. And that's the stuff that you have to understand that person. And we go back to the individual because that's the crucial bit. Because FASD is not a single thing. That's the other important thing. We talk about it as if it is FASD. It is not one thing. It is such a broad presentation. You know, I helped write that paper with the 428 conditions. Most people will not have 428 conditions. And that's the point, is that maybe how it presents in some. Some people will have a range of them, but not everybody has 428 conditions. Um, you have to take the individual, see what their presentation is, what their difficulties are, but don't forget the strengths. Build on that bit and put support around them for things that they find difficult. You know, two days may be different because there's other things happen. I have days where I woke up, you know, where I've not slept well or I've, I've had a crook in the neck and you're feeling uncomfortable. Now, I can say I've slept badly. I've got a stiff neck. You know, somebody else may, somebody with FASD may not recognize that. They just feel uncomfortable. So they feel more grumpy that day. So you have a worse day, but they're not telling you. And so, you know, we all have that. So it's that normalization of some of it, but understanding that actually the strengths are going to be there, the weeks is going to be there. If we put around the scaffolding, that will minimize it. So I talk about that arousal ladder in terms of trying to think about where we are on it, and trying to find ways to bring people down and identify what to do at each stage. So you never get to the escalated agitation where things have got too far and you're staying within a profile of manageable function, which is everybody because everybody's on this ladder, because if you push enough buttons, if I pushed enough of your buttons, I'm sure I could make you annoyed. It may take a while, but, so, you know, probably could. And you could certainly do that to me. But, um, <laughs> but well, not just you personally, but so other people could. Um, but you get the idea. But th that's the issue, is that we all have that in us. The tolerance for situations with somebody with FASD may be slower, and they may get to that, that blow up stage very quickly. But it's still the same principles is if you can bring people down in their arousal using a multimodal approach, thinking about that person, it doesn't matter what person over there does, it's your person, your individual kid, your individual adult, because don't forget the adults, because I always think that people forget this is not just a children's situation, it becomes adults and it stays with them. You know, things improve, but it, in some ways, but actually gets worse in others. Mm. And so because, the, as you said, the society doesn't change and expects adults to suddenly be able to manage everything and don't put the support around them. Mm. You put the support around them, they do well. You know, you can see that, but, the, the, but some of the needs don't go away, which is why it is about understanding all those in order to facilitate and improve the long term. Roger, thank you so much for your time today. Um, I'd just like to say to everybody that have posted up questions, as Raja said, we don't really want to get into the specifics, but I think Raja's covered such a vast area of FASD that it helps us understand and look at our own personal situations and be able to think maybe differently, how we could approach things differently, how we could look to the future with a bit more positivity um, with the new approaches that um, are coming forward in the country. It's as Roger said, it's early days. We're, you know, this is something we're developing, we're working on, and hopefully ideas that are being used as models at the moment will be successful and be able to be spread around the country as a successful model, having learned from our mistakes. So, um, you know, we, I think where we started a few years ago as a charity and it, it was, it, there wasn't a lot of positivity to be able to offer people. I really do feel that we're in a position now where there is greater positivity. If you want to do your bit to help 
create a better understanding or to be able to help spread the word about FASD, please do share posts on social media. You can go to our website and share our films, but also we're part of the UK Alliance and that's organizations that, that are trying to spread the word about FASD and doing some amazing work in their communities. Please share their posts on social media as well. That's what you can do right now to help. Um, let people understand and you know thank you so much we will be having Soji um Dr Soji Abiona will be presenting our next month's um webinar and we look forward to having him he'll be talking about neurodisability and diagnosis as well so we really look forward to having him in the meantime though Raja thank you so much really appreciate it we will put out tomorrow Ali who's our events organizer We'll be contacting everyone tomorrow with um, follow up information and thanking you all for attending today. And we are a charity. If you, we, Raj has been generous today to be able to offer his services for free. And we're very grateful for that. And as the charity, we organize these events. If you feel that you would like to put a small donation in, then feel free. We'll put the uh, ad out tomorrow as well in Ali's email. So in the meantime, thank you all so much, Raja. Enjoy the rest of your, uh, your break and uh, love to all the family. Thank you all so much for joining us. See you next time. All the Bye. best. Bye-bye. Thank you, Raja.